Uh, we're not going to look at uh, one particular uh, passage of Scripture this morning. We read from Ch- Hebrews chapter 10, which is uh, very important to what we're thinking about uh, this morning. Um, but I want to deal, deal more with a, a topic, um, and that is how does Christ uh, meet our greatest needs through his crucifixion? How does Christ meet our greatest needs through his crucifixion. And the the crucifixion of Jesus indeed uh, accomplishes a a variety of benefits and blessings uh, for all who put their trust in him and in his work of salvation. And the Bible uses uh, different words uh, to to describe these benefits uh, that show how Christ's death met all the needs, every need that we have as sinners. And the Bible uses uh, different terms uh, to describe these ways, to describe these benefits in which Christ meets our needs through his death. Uh, We may be familiar uh, with all the terms that are used, uh, maybe some of them, um, or maybe uh, some of these might be uh, new to us. But I'll go, I want to go through them uh, one by one. Some of them are big words, but hopefully in the explanation, we'll see that it's something very easy to understand. And the first term that we want to think about is the word on atonement. Now, the word atonement is a bit like uh, an umbrella. Uh, and this umbrella is, is covering uh, the work uh, of Christ in his life and in his death to earn our salvation. So uh, one definition of the word atonement is basically it means to remove the obstacle of sin so that we can become a friend of God. The removal of the obstacle of sin. So sin is an obstacle that is stopping our friendship Uh, our fellowship with God, atonement is to remove that obstacle so that we can become a friend of God. Now, when we go right back in the the early stages of the the scriptures, the books of Exodus, uh, Leviticus, and Numbers uh, in particular, uh, often speak uh, very directly about making atonement, how uh, this obstacle of sin is to be removed. But the idea of atonement is really found throughout uh, the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And atonement is necessary. It's needed because we are sinners. We are sinners. There is an obstacle between us and God. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the main question is always, how can a sinful person be accepted by a holy God? Now, the scriptures say that God can't even look upon sin. He can't dwell with sin. So how can someone who has sinned be accepted by a holy and pure God? And the answer is atonement, by atonement. Because the Bible shows us that sin is very serious. It's very serious. And it's a barrier. It's a barrier. It's an obstacle that separates us, that cuts us off from God. In Isaiah 59 verse 2, it says, Your iniquities or your sin have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Because of our sin, God hides his face from us and he doesn't hear us. Problem is, where does this barrier come from? We have put up the barrier ourselves. We have put up this obstacle By our sin. But then the problem is. We can do nothing. 
to take this obstacle away or to remove the barrier. We can do nothing of ourselves. But the Bible and the gospel, it gives us the, the good news. There's good news, and that is that God has dealt with our problem of how to remove this barrier. God has made the way for our sins to be removed, to be forgiven, so that we can become his friend, we can have peace with him. And how does God do this? He does it by atonement. Now, atonement is never something that you or me can do or that man can do, whether we're in the Old Testament or the New Testament. It's not something that we can bring about. In the Old Testament, and we read there from Hebrews chapter 10, and the writer talks about those Old Testament sacrifices. And he says, even though they're still carrying out these sacrifices, they will never take away sin. But the Old Testament sacrifices, the various sacrifices, they played a large part. A large part. But there was no merit in them, in themselves. But it was God's appointed way for that particular time, for that period, for the Old Testament. To remove the obstacle of sin between him and his people. One very important verse that was important in the Old Testament. It's still important today because it points us that there's only one way for this obstacle to be removed. Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you. This is God speaking. I have given it to you or given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. By the shedding of blood, by the giving of life, atonement is made. As we read in our reading from Hebrews 10, and as we uh, learn from the, the Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, these Old Testament sacrifices and rituals, they were shadows. It was, they were like pictures pointing forward to the, the only sacrifice, the real sacrifice, pointing forward to Christ and his ultimate sacrifice on the cross. So before Christ came, God appointed these means in the Old Testament of rituals and sacrifices to make atonement. But they were, it wasn't in themselves. It wasn't because you killed a bull that your sins were forgiven. It was because that bull was pointing forward to Christ, who is the only one who could take away the sin. So in the Old Testament, these sacrifices were God's appointed means of atonement. And what was necessary was blood shed for sin so the only way for the obstacle of sin to be removed is by the shedding of blood by the giving of a life that is until Christ's coming and then in the New Testament we see that what is central is the cross it's the crucifixion God's appointed way of atonement the way of salvation the way for sinners like you and me to be saved from our sin. To deal with that obstacle. To get rid of that obstacle. Our sin is an obstacle between us and God. And the only way for it to be removed. Is through what Christ has did on the cross. The atonement. The atonement was Christ. Taking our place. And doing for us. What we could never do. For ourselves. We're simply called, what's our part? What are we to do? We're simply called to respond to what he has done on our behalf by repentance and faith, by turning from our sin and turning to him in faith. Sinful men and women, sinful boys and girls, we're all in a desperate situation. We're all in a desperate plight because the Bible tells us that we're all lost. We're all lost in darkness. And we're on a road. We're traveling on a road that will eventually lead to destruction. And the thing is, is that as sinners, we don't realize that. 
we don't realize it unless God opens our eyes to see how things really are. Unless he opens our ears to hear his warnings and his instructions that will lead us to safety and will lead us in the right way. Unless he opens our hearts and opens our minds to respond in trust, to turn to the light, to turn onto that narrow path which leads to life. Turning to Jesus. Turning to Jesus. The only one who has atoned for sin as appointed by God. All those Old Testament sacrifices, they were all signposts pointing to Jesus. And when he came into this world, that's the work that he did. He atoned for sin. God's salvation. Now this atonement, I said it's a bit like, a, a, it's a bit like an umbrella. And you know if you've got an umbrella... Um, there are wire spokes in the umbrella and hopefully those wire spokes will keep the umbrella down over you. If there's a gust of wind, it'll turn it inside out and then you're soaked. But we're, think we're thinking about an umbrella. Uh, uh, the, the umbrella is the atonement and then there's spokes that come that support uh, this umbrella. And the supporting spokes in atonement, here are these various terms that the Bible uses. Redemption, substitution, imputation, propitiation, reconciliation, adoption, justification. Some, some big words, some big words, but they're big words because they have big benefits, big blessings for the people of God. And we all need, we all need the crucifixion of Jesus because we all need the atonement. The atonement that he accomplished because we have one big problem. So the, the, answer, the answer is that the atonement removes the obstacle. But our problem is summed up in one word and that is condemnation. Condemnation. Condemnation means that we are all under God's judgment. We're not born as cute and innocent as some would like to believe. Well, maybe some are more cute uh, than, than others. Uh, but we're certainly, we certainly don't come into this world as innocent. Because the Bible tells us that even when we're born, even in the mother's womb, we are in sin. Because we have a sinful nature. And when we're born... We come into this world with a sinful nature. Nature, We show our nature because we then go on to sin. We commit sin. When our first representative, when Adam was in the garden, he fell. He sinned. He sinned. God had told him to do something and he sinned. He broke it. And when he fell, we fell in him. And we fell with him. He was in the garden acting as our head, as our representative. And so what he did has affected us all. And his sin has infected all of us. We are all his heirs. We're all his children. Which is the reason, it's the reason that we, we can't live up to God's holy and righteous standards. And it's the reason why God's condemnation hangs over us as a result. He said to Adam, eat and you shall surely die. He ate and he didn't die immediately, but he, he eventually died. And every generation after him died. But that was the consequence of sin. And the consequence of our sin is death. In Ephesians 2 verse 3, Paul says that we are by nature, by our very nature, we are children of wrath. We are children under God's anger. God's anger hanging over us because of our sinful nature and our sinful behavior. Later on uh, to the Ephesians in chapter 5 verse 6, Paul goes on to say, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, and he's, he's given a list of, of sins, because of these sins, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 
sons and daughters of disobedience. We have all disobeyed. We have all sinned. Don't let anyone deceive you, says Paul. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And don't deceive yourself. God's anger, God's condemnation already hangs over the sinner because we're guilty. We have broken his law. We have disobeyed. His condemnation is based on his holiness and it's based on his justice. So our condemnation is deserved. We are guilty. We're guilty. And the verdict is death. Romans 3 verse 10, Paul says, No one is righteous. No one is right with God. No, not one. If a person continues in this way, if a person continues throughout life in their sin, in wickedness, remains unrepentant, it will end in eternal condemnation, eternal punishment. But it need not end that way. It need not end that way. And it's a real blessing that you're here today and you're here week by week to hear God's word and God's instructions calling you to the giving you the the good news that there's another way. There's a way out. There's a way to be rescued. There's a way out of condemnation because God has provided that way, the way to escape condemnation, the way to set us free from final condemnation. How how did he do it? John 3, 16, verse 18. Verses familiar to many of you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But listen, whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Believe in Jesus. Believe in the Savior. And this is God's promise. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. In relationship with Christ Jesus through faith. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Set free from that curse of condemnation that hangs over us. So God's solution, God's answer to our problem is atonement. Atonement is the answer to our sin and our condemnation because of our sin. I told you about the umbrella. The umbrella is the atonement, the work that God has done has done to remove the obstacle of sin. And there are various spokes that come out of the the umbrella. Uh, And one of these spokes is redemption. Redemption. Now, we might think that it's bad enough to learn that not only we're not good enough, because I'm sure there are some who think, well, I'm not that bad. I'm in church today. There are lots of people out there doing lots of bad things and here I, I, I'm in church and I tr- try to do the best that I can. But God's word has already told us we're, we've broken God's law and are condemned as a consequence. We're, not only are we not good enough, uh, we are sinners and under condemnation, but the Bible also informs us that we are actually in bondage to our sin. We are slaves to our sin. We cannot break loose from our sinful nature. One of the scriptures says that a leopard can't change its spots. Uh, a leopard can't become uh, a giraffe or, you know, the, 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 the markings on a giraffe. It, it just won't happen. You can't, it can't change its spots. And neither can we change our sinful nature. We're also, it goes on to tell us, that we're in bondage to Satan. We, we are slaves to God's enemy. 
And it says that we follow and serve his enemy whether we are aware of it or not. In John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking to some very religious people, religious leaders, but they don't have a faith relationship with God. They're, they're very religious. They're, 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 they're leaders in the religion, uh, but they don't actually have faith in God. And, and Jesus tells them that they actually belong to their father, the devil, and they do his works. In 1 John 5 verse 19, the Apostle John says, The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. But, but the atonement, the atonement changes all that. And this term, this word redemption, it comes from the word to redeem or to pay a price to pay a ransom. It's used uh, uh, of the, the purchase price to buy someone's freedom. The payment that was necessary to set a slave free. To redeem them by the payment of a ransom in order to secure their redemption. The penalty that is due to our sin is death. That's what we deserve because we have broken God's law. The penalty is death. And this is how death began at the very beginning in the garden. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And death enter, entered as a result of sin, disobedience, following the directions of the, the, of the devil. The penalty, the price owed for your sin and for mine is death. That is what is due. We are in bondage. We are slaves to our sinful nature. We are slaves to God's enemy. And we are slaves to death. And we cannot escape. We can do nothing to set ourselves free. But on the cross, what was happening at the crucifixion? Jesus paid the penalty price. He paid it and he paid it in full and his payment was accepted by God the Father who raised him from the dead the death of Jesus his blood shed his life given was the price required by God and paid in full by his son and as a result the Lord Jesus secured our redemption from slavery to sin, slavery to God's enemy, and slavery to death. And it's his death alone that can set us free. He died in our place. He took our place and paid the price for us. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life, here it is, to give his life as a ransom for many, to give his life as the redemption price to set us free from death, sin, and the devil. In Hebrews 2 verse 15, the writer says that through Christ's death, that he might deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. The unbeliever, the unbeliever is not his or her own. To do as they please. The unbeliever is a slave in service, lifelong slavery, serving in the kingdom of darkness and just stumbling through the dark. But Jesus, Jesus has paid the price that we owe. His life given as a ransom, as a redemption to set sinners free. So condemnation is the bad news. That's where we're at. The good news is God has provided the answer through atonement and redemption accomplished by Jesus through his death. Another two terms that are used by the scriptures and are very close to each other uh, and uh, another uh, spoke in the umbrella are representation and substitution. Very briefly on representation. 
in his work of atonement, Jesus came into this world and he was acting as our representative. Our first representative, uh, Adam, completely messed it up. Completely messed it up and infected us all with sin uh, and the consequence, which is death. He completely messed it up. The second representative came to undo all that he had, that he had done, all the way that he had messed up. Jesus came into this world to be our representative. His work in all that he did in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, it was all for his people. And he was victorious. He accomplished what he came to do. He accomplished it all for sinners who turn from their sin and put their trust and faith in him. His representation, acting as our representative. The other word is substitution. Um, I'm sure anybody interested in sport here and some football fans, I, uh, I, I do hear about some of the football fans here. Um, and uh, the, um, you know all about substitution. It's uh, someone taking the place of another. Uh, someone taking our place. And Jesus came to take our place. He came to be our substitute. He bore the judgment for sin that was ours. The judgment for sin that we deserve. Isaiah 53 verse 5. He was wounded. Why was he wounded? He was wounded not because for anything that he did. He was wounded for our transgressions. For our sins. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. For our sake he that is God made him that is Jesus. For our sake God made Jesus to be sin. He made him to be sin. To be everything that was contrary to him. To be sin who knew no sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The sinless Jesus identifies with sin to such a degree that he is said to be made sin for our sake. To take the judgment due to our sin so that we would be made righteous. In substitution, in Jesus taking our place, he was treated. He was treated on the basis of what we are. If you want to see if you want to think, to meditate upon what our sin deserves, think about the crucifixion. Because that's what we deserve. That is what we deserve. Suffering, punishment, and death. But he did it on our behalf. He became our substitute, taking our place. And so we can rejoice with Paul uh, uh, in Romans 8 verse 1 uh, we've already mentioned therefore there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus there's no condemnation and some of us need to get that in here there is now no condemnation get it in here and get it in here because sometimes our, we're up and down and we're all over the place Monday morning might not be too bad Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning things aren't going great and we're wondering have I done something against God has God Mess, messing things up for me here because uh, I haven't done this, that or the other. There is no condemnation. No condemnation. We cannot be condemned because he was condemned in our place. There is no condemnation now for all those who are in Christ Jesus. Another spoke in this umbrella is imputation. Imputation. Strange word. But it belongs to the atonement. And the word, the word simply means, or literally, literally means to reckon, to charge to one's account. It was part of the, the commercial and legal language of Paul's day. And the Apostle Paul writing to Philemon, and Philemon has been wronged by his uh, slave uh, Onesimus. Onesimus ran away, and he might have even stolen something uh, to help him on the, the journey. Um, and uh, he meets Paul and becomes a, a believer. And Paul is now writing back to Philemon. And excuse me, he says, he says, Phil uh, Onesimus has wronged you, Philemon. And whatever he's done, I want you to charge any debt that Onesimus owes you. I want you to charge it to me. Impute it 
to me. Imputation. Charge it to my account. If he owes you anything, charge me. Philemon verse 18. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. And that's this word, imputation. Charge it to my account. Reckon it to be mine. Impute it to me. In the Old Testament, David says, Blessed are those who, to whom the Lord does not impute their sin. God doesn't hold... Uh, 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 this, there's, there's no sin in your account book with God. He does not impute their sin. Blessed when the Lord doesn't reckon, doesn't charge sin to their account. That is when he forgives. Psalm 32 that we're going to sing at the end. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. And that's the word there. Counts no iniquity. Imputes no sin. There's, he no longer imputes it. He no longer reckons it to be yours. And Paul quotes from this psalm in Romans 4 verses 7 and 8. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Imagine that. First of all, our account book is full of sin. It's, it's, it's full of sin. From the very moment we've, we came into this world, it is full of sin. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. The account is cleared. It's wiped clean. Wiped clean. Imputation isn't based on anything that we do to try and clear the books or because we deserve it, because... because and we've done something to, so that our, our sin isn't counted against us. Imputation is based on God's love. It's a, his grace and his mercy. Romans 5 verse 8. God shows his love for us. While we were at church, while we were trying to be nice people, no, God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, while we were still rebelling against him, Christ died for us. There are two sides to this imputation. Two sides. On the one hand, our sins are imputed to Christ. They're charged to his account. He takes it all. He takes it all. And God deals with him accordingly. Punishes him and puts him to death. He deals with it. Our sins imputed to him. Counted as belonging to him. And he pays the price. For us. Then on the other hand, Christ's righteousness, his book, his account book, is full of obedience, perfect obedience, sinless obedience. His account book is accounted to us, charged to our account. So when God looks at us now, does he see a filthy book, a shameful book of sin? He sees. In your account, if you belong to him, belong to Christ, he sees perfect obedience, righteousness that has been given to us, imputed to us by Christ. Another term, another spoke in the umbrella. It's a bigger word. Propitiation. Propitiation. Um, I'm going to give you some verses so you can look up how to spell it. Uh, you can impress some of your friends um, if you tell them that you can spell propitiation. Um, it's another spoke in the atonement. Propitiation, it's a big word, but it's something very, very simple. Because the word simply means to turn away God's anger. To turn away God's anger. By means of an offering. To turn away his anger. Propitiation. It sounds, whoa, what, 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 what's that? It's simply. Well, it wasn't simple. But it's turning away God's anger by means of an offering. Here are some of the places that you might find it. Hebrews 2 verse 17. Therefore he, talking about Christ, he had had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Here it is, to make propitiation. That is to make an offering to turn away God's anger. A propitiation for the sins of the people. 
1 John 2 verse 2. He is Jesus. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 4 verse 10. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son, what to do? To be a propitiation for our sins. To, to become an offering to turn away God's anger from us. And to turn it on who? To turn it on his own son. For him to, to, to experience the wrath, the anger of God for our sin on himself. Him who knew no sin, who'd never committed sin. God's wrath, God's anger is mentioned more often uh, in the Old Testament, but certainly it's still there in the New Testament. Uh, our sin deserves its due reward because God is angry with our sin. He's not indifferent to it. God doesn't, you don't say, oh God, forgive me. And God sweeps it under some uh, celestial uh, carpet of cloud. Um, he's not indifferent to it. The bad news in the letter to the Romans, Romans 1 verse 18, is the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all and the unrighteousness of men. The sin of men, women, boys and girls. Paul argues there at the beginning of the letter to the Romans that, that all men, Jews, Gentiles, it doesn't matter who you are, we all come under the wrath and condemnation of God. That's the bad news. But in Romans 3 verse 25, he gives us the good news. In Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. We receive this benefit. God's anger, God's anger is removed from us when we put our faith in his son. When we put our trust in his son. The bad news in Romans 1, God is angry with us because we have sinned. The good news in Romans 3 is that God has put forward his own son, Jesus Christ, to be a propitiation, to be a sin offering, to turn away his anger because of our sin. And we receive that. We receive that gift as we receive all the other benefits and blessings by faith. By simply trusting in the Saviour. The reality for us all is that your sin and mine have incurred the anger of God. And that anger can only be turned away. It can only be removed by Christ's death on the cross. And his offering of atonement. And to make propitiation. Condemnation is what we deserve. But through faith in Christ we have received, we received the benefits of of the atonement, redemption, substitution, uh, representation, imputation, propitiation. Next term is reconciliation. The main idea behind this word is a, a change of attitude or a change of relationship. Because of our sin, um, there's that obstacle, that barrier. So we're, we're not friends with God. We're not at peace with God. Rather, we're, we are enemies of God. We are not for God, but we're against him. We might, well, but I'm in church. Yes, but if you, if you don't belong to God through faith in his son, you're, you're not for him. You're not for him because he, God says, the only way that you can be a friend with me is to, be, to believe in my son. If you're not believing in my son, then we're not friends. But rather, you're not for me. You're against me. And he is not for us, but rather against us. But through the death of Christ, through the atonement, through faith in him, we are brought into a right relationship with God. There is reconciliation. The two are brought together. He is no longer against us. Now he is for us. We have peace with God. We have access with him. We are to him. We have fellowship with him. Sin separates us from God. Romans 5 verse 10, Paul says that we are enemies before reconciliation. In Romans 8, 7, he says that we're hostile to God. In Colossians 1, 21, he says not only that, not only are we hostile to God, we're hostile in our mind, in, our, in the way that we think and the, the evil deeds that we do. 
And this attitude, this way of thinking and behavior needs to be changed. It needs to be removed if there's to be a change in relationship. And this change of relationship can only happen through reconciliation. It's when God begins his work in us through the gospel. When he begins to work in our hearts. When that word begins to speak to us and convince us that we are a sinner. That we are unrighteous, we're not right with God, that there is a judgment coming. When he convinces of that and begins to draw us by his spirit to believe and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. It's through the cross, through the, the crucifixion, that our enmity becomes fellowship. That hostility becomes faith, that rebellion becomes obedience. Reconciliation and adoption. Adoption, another spoke. God adopts us to be one of his own, to become a child of God. Ephesians 1, verse 5, Paul gives us the reason for adoption. He says, in love, in love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. God adopts us into his family, not because we're, we're good people or nice people. Uh, he thinks that we're, he'll get along okay with us. He adopts us out of his love. It's through his grace. It's because of his mercy, his undeserved favor towards us who were previously his enemies and hostile towards him. And his adoption, in his adoption, we're delivered. We're delivered from the past. We're delivered from our sin. We're delivered from our service to Satan. We're, we're delivered from following him and serving him. We're given a new status. We, we become the children of God. We become part of the family of God. Not only that, we, we have no idea what is ahead of us because we're told that we're also heirs. We are going to inherit. We're going to inherit. We're given a new start. We've been made a new creation. We've been given a new life. Children of God now in this life, we, but we also have a future and a certain hope of eternity with our heavenly Father. Adoption is part and parcel of what Jesus accomplished in the crucifixion, in his death for our sakes. And the final term, maybe it should have been at the start, but, um, but it's, it's, it's one of the spokes, is justification. Justification, another big word, but it's a legal word, um, but it means, it means that uh, we are pronounced not guilty, we're accepted, we're treated as if we had never sinned, as if we were righteous. There's also another part, another side to it. That is that we are entitled to all the privileges of those who have, as if we had kept the law. Justification. God says, you're no longer guilty. You're no longer condemned. But not only that, you will have all the privileges, the benefits and the blessings, as if you had never sinned. Not guilty, no condemnation, accepted by God. And the basis of God's not guilty verdict is the death and the resurrection of his son on our behalf, in our place, where justice is done. As I said, God doesn't sweep sin under a carpet of cloud. It's not swept away. It has to be paid. It has to be paid for. Either you will pay it for, with, by yourself if you continue in unrepentance, continue in your sin, you will one day when you meet the Lord, you will pay that price for yourself. But here and now, God is saying, he's calling you. He's calling you. He's, he, he wants to rescue you through his son who, can, who has paid the price in your place. Justice is done. Sin is dealt with. Sin is paid for. The penalty is, has been paid in the death of Christ. And in the resurrection, God declares... His son declares his people right with God. Not guilty verdict. And it's this not guilty verdict, it's issued on the basis of faith. Again, I say each of these benefits and blessings, they're all received by faith, by simply trusting Jesus to be your saviour. In the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, 
Jesus tells about two men that go to the temple. One of them is the Pharisee, a very religious person. He goes in and he says, God, look at me. Whoa. Look at me. I'm a religious person. Look at all the good things that I've done. Look at all the things I've tried to do to help others. He's trusting in his own self-righteousness, in his own good works. He's saying, what a good religious boy I am. Whereas Jesus says, the tax collector, the tax collector knows, he knows that he's a sinner. In faith, he acknowledges and he confesses his sin. And Jesus says, it's this sinful tax collector who goes home justified, who goes home right with God, not guilty, question is are you going to leave this building today? Are you going to go back home justified? Are you going to leave this place today right with God? Not guilty. No condemnation. And you simply to receive this gift from God it's simply to say God have mercy upon me a sinner. I cling, I cling to your son, the only saviour. What a salvation there is in Jesus. The saving of men and women and boys and girls from the power and from the effects of sin. In Psalm 28 verse 9, the psalmist says, The Lord is my salvation. He's the only salvation. There's no other name given under heaven by which a man can be saved. The man, the man Christ Jesus. What a work of God in the crucifixion. In the atonement, the work of Christ to earn our salvation, to make us at one with God, to remove the obstacle of our sin that separates us from him. The bad news is we're all condemned. We're all under his condemnation because of our sin. The good news, here's what God has done through his son. Atonement, redemption. Jesus has paid the price on the cross to set us free. No condemnation through him. Representation, substitution. He has represented us. He became our substitute on the cross. He took our place uh, and he took our judgment upon himself. Imputation, our sins imputed to him, charged to him, and he pays for them. His righteousness, his perfect obedience charged to our account. Propitiation, his death on the cross, it was an offering, an offering of himself to take away God's anger and condemnation. Reconciliation, his death, taking away our sins, making peace with God. No longer enemies, no longer hostile, no longer in rebellion, but in fellowship with God. An adoption made children of God, made heirs of God. Justification through his death, declared not guilty and entitled to all the privileges that befits a child of God's kingdom. To him be all the praise and all the glory.